Hey my friends, I'm John. Welcome back to All Cars, where we talk about all cars all the time. And we probably all remember Hummer, the brand that environmentalists love to hate. Came from a military replacement for the Jeep, expanded into three sport utilities and sport utility trucks, and then just as quickly as it came, disappeared in General Motors bankruptcy. Something about Hummer got me thinking the other day, I think it's probably because they're coming out with a new Hummer as a GMC sub-brand that's going to be all electric, but I found myself reading about the history of Hummer and AM General, the manufacturer, and I'm completely blown away. This is the most fascinating story. I'm going to go ahead and warn you, it's going to be long. It's going to be a little complicated, but if you stick with it, the intricacies of what went on behind the formation of the Hummer brand is absolutely fascinating. So grab yourself a cold one, strap in, and take this journey with me. Okay, so the story of Hummer starts with AM General. That is the manufacturer, a company that does defense contract stuff. But before we get there, we've got to step back in time to 1903, let's say. The Standard Wheel Company of Indiana expanded in 1903 to include the Overland Automotive Division. In 1908, John Willis purchased Overland and renamed it Willis Overland. And certainly, if you're a fan of automotive histories, you know the Willis name, because they're the ones that designed the Jeep, built it in collaboration with Ford, and launched an American icon. Now in 1953, Kaiser Motors pushed, purchased Willis Overland and changed their name to, first, Kaiser Willis Motor Corporation, later Kaiser Jeep. Now, Kaiser was a huge conglomerate. They were involved in steel, with aluminum and chemicals, and other heavy industries like shipbuilding. So in 1964, Kaiser purchased part of Studebaker, right? They purchased some facilities from Studebaker, including a, uh, a manufacturing plant, as I understand it, in South Bend, Indiana, and Studebaker's General Products Division which included substantial defense contracts. Now, because they had, an, uh, Kaiser had an army truck contract, they agreed to build them at that South Bend plant. So we're in 1964 now, keep that, keep that straight. Now in 1970, American Motors Corporation purchased Jeep from Kaiser. Kaiser being a huge conglomerate, automotive was such a small part of it, and things were getting out of date. They didn't want to invest the money in it, so they looked for a buyer, and I think it was for a little over $70 million. AMC agreed to buy Jeep, thinking it would give them an easy ramp into sport utility vehicles and trucks. In 1971, AMC made that general products division a wholly owned subsidiary. So I think what that means is they separated the defense contract portion from the Jeeps and other commercial vehicles that you and I would buy. Now, that's 1971. We all know that when Chrysler bought AMC, but we forget there was a short period of time in there. AMC increased their relationship with Renault and at one point, Renault bought a controlling interest in AMC. Now, at the time, the U.S. government had uh, rules that said a defense contractor could not be owned by a foreign government. So since France owned part of Renault and Renault controlled AMC, AMC had to spin off their defense contract portion. They had named that wholly owned subsidiary AM General. The general comes from the General Products Division. So because of this, in 1983, LTV Corporation bought AM General, set it up as own subsidiary. 
Now, LTV is fascinating in and of itself. We've got to talk this about this for just a minute here. In 1947, a gentleman by the name of James Ling founded an electrical contracting business. 1947. In 1956, he bought an electronics company. In 1959, he added a, another electronic company that made stereo systems and speakers. And in 1960, he merged with Temco Aircraft. Now, Temco did a lot of work on different parts for aircraft. They could do um, renovation work, um, overhauling products. They also worked on pieces of or systems within like the B-29 Super Fortress, for example. But they were brought into Ling's company. Now, in 1961, so one year later, they got some additional funding from rich people, and they acquired a company called Chance Vault Aerospace. Now, Chance Vault is <laughs> fascinating by itself. They had a long history since 1970, uh, 1917, changed names, they got bought or partially owned by people, but during World War II, they produced thousands of aircraft, including the F-4U Corsair. They also had, as the years went on, expanded into their missile systems. Now, through the 60s and the 70s, they continued to add other companies to their holding company, LTV, including in 1967, Wilson and Company, the sporting goods company. Ever had a Wilson ball? They were owned by LTV, the same company that owned AM General later on. So by 1983, LTV bought AM General, established it as a wholly owned subsidiary. The Hummer H1, as it was later known, was introduced in 1983, and famously, Arnold Schwarzenegger saw an army convoy while he was filming the, the movie Kindergarten Cop and began to campaign and lobby for a civilian version of the Hummer. In 1992, AM General began selling a civilian version of the Humvee. It's not just another 4x4. It's a Hummer. It's a beast, slightly tamed. And the first two were purchased by Schwarzenegger, conveniently. They did so themselves, but in 1999, December of 99, AM General sold the brand name Hummer to General Motors. So GM was responsible for all of the marketing and distribution of all the civilian Hummers produced by AM General. GM went on to introduce two of its own designs, the H2, which was a large sport utility, but it was based on the same platform as the Chevy Tahoe, things like that, but with a, a heavy duty 2500 series suspension up at the front, as I understand. And then later the H3, which was based on the Chevy Colorado platform, although heavily, heavily modified. Now, AM General continued to produce the H1 the whole time. They produced the H2 for General Motors. General Motors moved production of the H3 down to Louisiana alongside the, the Colorado and the GMC Canyon. Now, they exported, but I never knew they began producing versions like the H3 at a plant in South Africa and also had some assembly done by a company called Avtator, I believe, in Russia, but only for local markets. Now, as we all know, around 2008, 2009, the economy started to collapse and sales were never great. The H1 had been canceled. The H2 may have been canceled by that time. Everything was on the table for General Motors, and they entertained multiple offers for the brand. As a matter of fact, there was a company from China that was trying to get permission to buy it, and it just all kind of fell through. So eventually, during GM's bankruptcy, Hummer was closed down as an independent division. But, in something only maybe attorneys could explain, it was never moved to the assets liquidation that held everything else that became the new modern General Motors. It was kept separate. And of course, as we know, GM is now relaunching it as a very upscale electric vehicle. I don't want to go through the history and the models and the engine choices of each one of the Hummers. It's really not the point here. We want to talk about this really varied history that connects Hummer 
with Jeep, with companies that manufacture airplanes like the Corsair in the middle. It's absolutely fascinating to me. But the one thing I didn't know that I uncovered is that right before General Motors was canceling everything, they had produced a concept car called the Hummer HX. This was going to be a smaller and lower priced Hummer that was ultimately going to be called the H4 that would have been a direct competitor for the Wrangler. Would have had a 3.6 liter V6, a six speed automatic, a body on frame design. This is really exciting. They could have had a Hummer in the market that the Bronco and the Bronco Sport are in today. That's pretty exciting, but it was never meant to be. But if that's not interesting enough, the HX was sold, the rights to the H Hummer HX brand was sold to a company called MEV, My Electric Vehicle. And they produce this as a small electric vehicle meant for golf courses and gated communities. So the Hummer, the Humvee, military replacement for the Jeep, one of the best off-roaders possibly ever created if you can get over its size, has now been reduced to a stylized golf cart. So I hope you guys found this nearly as interesting as I did. I'm excited to see what Hummer becomes when it becomes electrified. It's From what I've seen, the price is going to be rich, but it's super interesting. I'm glad to see him come back because they were so roundly hated. And it honestly bothered me because the H2 and the H3 were really no different than any other sport utility or truck that was out there. But the environmentalists absolutely had it in their sights and went after it. And I remember it clearly. And I had a friend of mine had an H2, a yellow H2 with customized um, stereo system. As I recall, it was a bad beast. It was. I didn't like them at the time, but as I look at them more in the past, I like them more and more. I had no idea their story was as fascinating as it is. Appreciate your time today, guys. Let me know what you think below.